Hi, everybody. Welcome back to a very special episode of the Unstoppable Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Keegan Lamar. And today I had to don a little bit of black and gold so that I could pay some respects to my good friend here, Michael Willett. Now, Michael Willett was a running back for UCF, um, the old Knights right down there in Central Florida. And so um, we're going to be talking about him, his story, the business that he runs now called Walk On Nation and the work that they do with athletes as a whole and talk a little bit about the mental journey along the way and some of the things that made him successful, some of the things he he was challenged with, how he deals with them now because he's doing a lot of work now helping athletes overcome a lot of the pitfalls that they run into as soon as sports ends for them. And obviously this is a little bit of a wake-up call to a lot of people who work with athletes after they transition, obviously that stuff's really important, but if you're an athlete now listening to this, you're going to want to pay attention because there's a lot of stuff here, especially the work that Michael's doing with athletes currently that honestly can save you a ton of headache and might be able to bring you a little bit more success while you're still playing the game just by listening to this episode. So pay attention, listen up. And if you're an athlete, um, sit down, relax, and share this out with other athletes as well. So Michael, hey man, I appreciate you being here. I must say that was a great introduction, Keegan. I definitely appreciate you having me on. That was that was top notch for an intro. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I try and pride myself on on being able to give people a good intro. That's it. That's all I got to do. And then from there, it's super easy. Um, but hey, man. So uh, first thing I want to talk about: How long have, did you play the game for? When did you start? I started when I was eight years old. Is when I started playing football back in Long Island, New York. Basketball was my first sport because New York, you have to play basketball if you oh, live there. Oh, 100%. <laughs> You're born. And it's just like um, there's basketball courts everywhere, first and foremost, all you know, all the outdoor basketball exactly. courts. So you got to cut your teeth there. Yeah, born with basketball in my hand. But after a while, my basketball coach wanted me to try to play football. And after that, the rest is history. I ended up moving to Florida around middle school, high school years. Then from there, I got to UCF. And now I'm here at Walk on Nation. There's been... A journey that I know we will dive into more in this podcast, but it's been a roller coaster ups and downs of this one. I will never forget and I won't change for anything because it made me who I am today and it brought me to where I am today. So yeah. Definitely started at a young age and football was like I said, was always after it was introduced to me, that was my main sport from there on out. Yeah. And that was, I mean, one of the things that I, I had a almost a very similar um kind of youth, like basketball is my first sport, favorite sport. Um, and then my dad and my brother, obviously my, my dad played, um, football at the pro level. And he also played in college and my brother, um, loved playing football. And then there was me. I did not want anything to do with it. And my parents actually said, you have to try it for one season. And if you hate it, you never have to do it again. And obviously I played it and I was like a head taller than in like a whole body wider than every other kid out there in middle school. And there, and so there were all these people saying, you have to do this, you have to do this. And at some point it just conditioned me where I was just like, I'm clearly going to have a little bit more success and I might as well be able to play both because, you know, oftentimes there's very little overlap, especially when you're in, you know, the middle school, high school time between football and basketball and football made basketball a lot easier of a, of a game to play. Cause you're, I mean, the physicality of it, there are some people who, when you only play basketball and that's the pinnacle of physicality that you're usually used to. Um, and then you come in at football, you're just like, this is like, th this is easy. This is just a part of the game and you can really learn to dish it out. And obviously, you know, playing those two sports, there's so much that overlaps with them, the explosiveness, but also the endurance training and all these other things. I mean, Basketball was created as a um, off-sport training method for football athletes. Right. That's so, so the the obviously you get into football, you figure out you're good at it, and then you go into high school and things start getting serious for you. You start looking at colleges and all this other stuff. I mean, I'd love to kind of start there from a mental perspective, right? Thinking back on high school, the game's fun. The game's pure still, right? But then you start thinking about the next level. Like, what's the stuff that started to change for you? When my sophomore year, when I was starting on varsity, then the letters started coming in of the colleges recruiting and all that stuff. But my story was unique because my junior year is when a lot of stuff came in. And from junior to senior year, things just flipped. Like, where 
coach didn't play me as much in the position that I was getting recruited at. They put me from running back to fullback at the time of like 160 and the tailback behind me is 225. I was like, what sense does this make? <laughs> so <laughs> getting carries almost and getting that exposure that I had before went out the window. And you know what college coaches, once that film is gone for the next year, they pass you by. So junior year, I knew it was serious. I knew I had the talent because a lot of division one schools were reaching out to me. But senior year, it all went away. And that was the mental piece. That was really a hard pill for me to swallow because I knew I had the ability. If I didn't, college coach would be reaching out to me. They would be sending me letters, inviting me out to camps, inviting me out to visits, all these things. Yeah. So I knew I had the talent. So it was my pride kicked in my senior year when I started to get Division two, Division three. Mind you, nothing wrong with those schools at all. Nothing wrong with those division colleges. But I knew I had the talent because other coaches were speaking to me. Yeah. So me getting to UCF was actually a very – unique story i call it divine intervention at the utmost so what happened was end of my senior year nothing coming in just there was a a showcase for division two and division three colleges where you just go and they hand you flyers and stuff that really shot me down like wow i guess that's what i'm gonna have to do like i said before it's not like it's a bad thing but for me at that time me being young I'm like no i'm better than this and i don't deserve this so yeah. i ended up ucf i live in orlando UCF came to see me once before. So I ended up going to UCF, the school, to the office to go talk with Coach O'Leary, the head coach at the time. And you and I both know, finding the head coach in his office on off season is almost impossible. It is virtually <laughs> impossible to do. So I showed up there. The recruiting guy ended up seeing me, who recognized me. And he brought me into Coach O'Leary, was in his office at the time. He brought me and said, hey, coach, this is our guy, Michael Will. He's with us. And Coach was like, wait, what? How come I don't know about this? So I was just sitting there like, uh. <laughs> so he called the running back coach in the office right now. He said, come to the office right now. I need to talk with you. So he put it, pretty much put the coach in the spot and said, can this kid play? And would he be able to survive on the team? Because I asked Coach, like, I don't want a scholarship. I just want to prove I can play. Yeah. I'll earn what I have to from there. So the, heck, the running back coach said, yeah, he can play. The lawyer said, all right, great. You're on the team right now. <laughs> So preferred walk on spot right then and there. They put my wow. name. Wow! I got all my letters and everything sent after that. So you know how rare that that's the one in a million chance for that to happen. So that's right. why I say divine intervention at the fullest. So that's how I got to UCF, and that's where everything from there took off. Where my mental toughness picked up. Everything happened to where that one moment changed the rest of my life. But you had to make that decision for yourself, right? Like you had to say, you know what, I'm gonna go. I'm going to go and have a conversation because for you, you kind of made up, it sounds like you made up your mind prior to even arriving at UCF. You're like, I'm going in here and my expectation for myself is I'm going to go in, talk to them. And I want to walk out with, you know, with, with, with something here. I want to walk out with whether it's a spot on the team, a shot or, a, you know, a tryout or anything like that. You had to step into that and say, I have to make this decision. I have to go after this. Right. Absolutely. And with that, it was my parents pushed me too because the scared kid me said, so I was like, eh, what's the point of me going if they don't talk to me more? But my mom and dad said, no, you're going. Yeah. And them forced me into that, which is I will forever be grateful for them for that. Is they got me to that moment to where as soon as I stepped in that building, I said, all right, I really got nothing to lose now. I'm here. So I guys might as well prove my case. And that's how it happened. Man, that's such an interesting. So when you're a high school kid, it's a really interesting dynamic because kids just start getting letters, right? And you go into coach's office and I would go into, and, and I don't know if this is at your high school too, but you go into coach's office and he has letters everywhere. And he's just like, Hey guys, you know, come get your letters. And, um, and so you go in there and you'd, you'd see all these different schools and you'd see them addressed to certain people. And you just start thinking in your head, well, this person is not better than me. Why are they getting letters from here? Or why am I not getting letters from these places, these places? Because you start getting, I, I mean, when you're playing at high school and you're a pretty good athlete, right? And I say pretty good, meaning you're, you know, top five athlete on your team for like, you know, whatever your class is, usually you're getting um, D2, D3 letters. Like that's just happening, right? Because you're being recruited within the state um, or surrounding states. And then, you know, a couple of guys will get some D1 letters and you're like, that's what I want to go after. I want that feeling. 
Um, and, and there's almost this mindset of, am I settling if I go with any of these other schools? Now, that's not to say D2, D3, JUCO, any of this other stuff, that they're not good teams. I mean, you've seen how hard the people on, um, oh, what is it? The, um, the Netflix series, Last Chance U, right? Like JUCO schools and stuff like that. Like they go hard. They go very hard and they're meant to, to prep people. And there are some people who have to go through that to be able to get another year of experience and coaching and get great film and all that other stuff. And some people just don't fall into that. Um, but there's this, there's this weird dynamic where if you're a high school kid, you get these letters and you start going through your head. Is this what I want? Is this what I not want? And you can feel a little bit defeated because up until that point, you've never really had to step out of your comfort zone to go after something you truly want. And that's where parents play such an amazing role where they can say, you're going over it. Cause I did the same thing with the university of Colorado. Um, I was being, now I was being recruited by, you know, CSU, Duke, Vanderbilt, um, and also uh, my dad's alma mater, Stanford, they had flown me out for um, a recruiting trip and stuff. And that was a whole debacle in itself. A guy got approved for a sixth year of eligibility. Um, and so they kept their long snapper and they're like, unfortunately, we're, we're not going to bring anybody. But I had to go in and I took, you know, my CD, my highlight film, which was me long snap. I think it's on YouTube, me long snapping in a kid's indoor turf soccer arena like there's little children running around and then there's me long snapping to my older brother um and I just I had that on film and I brought it in and coach was literally timing me sitting at his desk and he was just like you know this is when blah 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 but I had to go and it was the most uncomfortable thing to sit in front of a coach and have them basically evaluate you there and then um and a kid who's in high school has never had to do something like that. And that's why parents are so important in the college space. I mean, was that roughly your experience? Like the kind of the, there's no way I'm going to go and try and jump into this, but your, your parents, it sounds like your parents were just like, nah, if you want this, you go after it. Was that kind of your first experience stepping into the unknown like that? Exactly. My parents knew my ability more than I did because I was a very humble kid. They always told me you're too humble for your own good. So after a while, they pushed me into the potential they knew that I had. So, I, like I said, I'll forever be grateful for them because they saw in me what I didn't see. Because after a while, Gibson had after not playing other kids who you know you're better than getting offers, this, that, to where it takes a toll. Like, well, I guess I give up. So without them, I wouldn't be here. They pushed me to the point of, well, you have to do this. This, this is what you're doing right now is life. There will be times in life where things aren't fair, things are not going to go your way, but you got to make a path for yourself. My dad always told me, no matter what you do in life, make sure you be successful in order to make it. Don't let anyone stop you because you're the only obstacle in your way. No one else can really hold you down unless you hold yourself down. So you can find a way to figure out something to get out of it. And without those messages, hearing that all the time, like I said, I would not be here and I'm forever grateful for what they did with that. Man, and and what a... What a powerful, powerful statement for um, for your father to make because, I mean, obviously we know it to be hyper true and there's so many kids today who think, you know, as, as long I should be, I should be getting this and this and this. And there are times where, and obviously I don't think it's, you know, it, it's a combination of a million different things, but it happens a lot where people say, well, if I go and do these things, then I should be getting this. And sometimes expectations and reality don't match up. And a lot of people, especially as athletes and we'll, we'll dive into this, like expectations, and reality, especially for college football, right? Like you make it to college football, you get there and you think to yourself, man, I'm going to be playing college football. I'm going to be playing on, you know, what for 99% of every single football athlete, um, besides guys who are in the pros, like that's the biggest stage you get, and, you, and it gets the biggest crowds, right? Like you, you don't have stadiums that had over, have over 100,000 people in the pros, um, but you do have a pretty good amount of them when, when you go into the college level, right? And it is, and the fans are more, I mean, dare I say, insane to, to an extent. 
Right. Um, people are invested in this stuff. This is part of their blood. When, when you go even at UCF, right? Like you, there are people who they've given their entire life for, to just follow the team, support the team and see the team do great things. And obviously great people have come out of UCF. Um, so you get to college. Now I'm going to tee this up. You get to college and it's UCF. When did you first start? Did you graduate and then go down or did you just go down for fall camp? Did you do summer training with them? I did summer training. Okay. Cause I graduated high school and two days later I was running stadiums with, with CU, which was nuts. And, you, you both. um, so you're, you're in Florida the whole summer. Now, obviously expectations and reality, you think, Oh, Florida's beautiful. It's not if you're summer training, especially for a football team, is it? When I tell you <laughs> the reality that got hit in my face when I got there, I literally got punched in the face. It was so hot and so much work that, of course, you train thinking you know what you're going to step into, but you never really know what you're walking into until you're in it. And they even separated us from freshmen with the older guys, of course, to get us acclimated. But that still sucked. <laughs> so. Yum. We had an indoor facility, which at the time had no AC. So it was just blowing just fans, blowing fans, which didn't do anything but make loud noise. So it was like a convection oven. We were, it was so hot. I couldn't, then that was the same day we had to run 24 110s in a certain amount of time. I've never been pushed to the, the brink so soon ever in my life. Of course, I got through it because I was a grit in me, but that was the, Real reality check, right? It's great and all. I made the team, but there's a lot more I got to do, and I got to pick it up Yeah, because I'm in a different space now. And a lot of kids don't realize once you hit college, everyone's the best of the best on their teams. So you're walking to a whole new element. You were the best guy on your high school team. Great. So we're all we. We're all the best in our teams. Now what? So that whole favoritism, in a sense, goes out the window when you step on that field as a freshman. That goes out the window because you forgot there's a sophomore, junior, red shirt. They all want to play too. They're not moving aside for you to come in. And I got hit hard, especially being a walk on too. That was a tough one to swallow. Yeah. Cause you, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. You, everybody, it, you, you go to college, doesn't matter, D1, D2, D3, you're playing against the whole country's best that they have to offer. And when I say the best, it's the 1% of high schoolers um, in terms of talent, that, that 1% of elite talent gets distributed all throughout, you know, D1, D2, D3. There, there's a spectrum there of, you know, who's the top 0.01%. And obviously, um, but it's all within that, that range there. You are playing against guys who, from a physical perspective, there's, within your position, there are, there's a, such a slim difference between, um, now, obviously when you're coming in from high school, it's just a different animal. You are going to get stronger because you're, you're entering probably the prime of your physicality, right? That whole 18 to 23 range is kind of the, where as, as men, you develop the most, physically and you know with your speed your strength all these other things and you everybody's given these tools so as a freshman obviously you play a little bit of catch up but still at the end of the day you go into camp and everybody is so close in terms of the competition level um and the physical skill and all that other stuff that it really starts coming down to the mental stuff um that starts separating people and that does obviously and we were talking about you know, obviously you talked about the heat down in Florida, you're in like a convection oven, everybody's coming out and they're just like, Jesus, put a fork in me. Right. And then here in Colorado, we would do the, the saving grace is you get really cool mornings and because it's really thin air. So the, the temperature changes, you could wake up and it'd be 50 degrees. And then by one o'clock, it's like a hundred, 105 and you'll be on turf. And so you get these 50 degree, 50 to 60 degree swings throughout the day. Um, and so I always, 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 anybody who goes to the university of Colorado, just train in the morning, just get there. The earliest group, you will be so much happier. I promise you. Um, but we'd always do speed work in the afternoon and the turf was blazing hot. Um, and when you're in the summer, they don't want you messing with the grass. 
because if you tear up the grass, it's really fine. Um, so they're like, take all your speed work and all your chop steps and all that other stuff, take it over to the turf and your feet are just absolutely on fire and you're constantly drenching them in water to try and save yourself just a little bit. Um, but the mental game from high school to college, there's all these different things, the competition level, your spot on the roster, you're really having to think about, um, every single play. Do you, uh, you know, how do you perform? Like you don't think about these things in high school and then also the business, right? The business and the politics of sports start kicking in. What was that like for you? And what did you struggle with? That it was definitely a lot, especially being a walk on and seeing the business side, the film, the mental aspects. Definitely, it still was a hard pill to swallow. Especially, I know I'm doing better than certain guys, but I can't get the reps because I'm out of scholarship and they got to make sure their scholarship guys get the rep. That was a hard pill to swallow. Also, you learn that the eye in the sky does not lie. So, <laughs> there is no loafing, slacking, any of that, because if you mess up, it's on film. And that is, you know this, and special teams being the worst feeling ever is when you know you messed up and the film is coming and coach puts that laser pointer on you and he asks, who is this? Me? Who's me? Then you know it's, it's showtime. You're about to get really Yeah, followed by, what the f <laughs> Just <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Well, that being able to deal with that and be able to not get upset and realize that it's coming from a place where they want you to do your best and realize that I can't slack on any single play. Like in high school, you can take a play off here, here, up there. They're not really filming. In college, every single thing is filmed. Yep. From individuals to the last team session, everything is filmed. So that mental component, getting used to that. And also being a walker, trying to figure out how do I get on the field? Yep. I'm glad that Coach O'Leary was big on special teams because he taught me he always said early, if you want to play, play special teams. So the whole figuring out reps and stuff and running back, I said, all right, I'll get that eventually. Screw that. I got to figure out, to one, get my scholarship, two, how to get on this bus. The only way to get on this bus is special teams. So it pretty much turned me from being the guy, the guy that talks to people. I didn't talk to anybody after a while. I literally shut it off. And when practice came, I was a psychopath on the field for special teams. I made sure I got on the film, whether I was wrong or right, that I was flying, running full speed to where Coach O'Leary would notice and was like, who's this kid? I want him somewhere. Find him and put him somewhere. Yeah. And it got to that point. After one year, the next year, I was on all four special teams because I made sure that I was going to get noticed because, one, I don't want parents to pay for my school anymore. They did enough for me, and I refused for them to have to pay for me ever again. Two, I want to play. It's great being on the sideline and stuff, being in the atmosphere, but the competitor in me, I want to play. So I'm going to get on this field in one way or another. Because you also know, in college sports, someone can get hurt in the drop of a dime. And if you're on the bus, you're next man up. So I want to make sure if the opportunity came, I was there. So dealing with all that in my mind, it got to the point where mentally I was so tough, but I was tough to a fault because I shut down my social side. I made sure I didn't do anything, no party, no anything. I made sure I'm getting on that bus. I don't care what you got to do. And after that, I'm getting a scholarship. I'm playing. Yeah. I don't care. Anything else outside of that? Yeah, whatever. And I'll that's do my not brief. easy. That's not easy at all to shut that stuff off. And there are a lot of people who say, oh, athletes should be, you know, you should be balanced. You should have a social life. You should do this. You should do that. What you did was a purposed balance, which was shut everything else out. I'm going to focus on um, training, recovery, football, football, football and get by in school, right? And, and that for you is probably what balance meant to you. That's exactly what balance meant for me because my goal was to make sure I get on scholarship, my parents don't have to pay for me ever again. Yeah. I did not want to see my parents struggle to pay for myself. I don't care what happens, I'm getting a scholarship. I don't care how I get it, but I'm getting it. So everything else outside of that the whole living the college life and all that, I, I didn't live that for the first two years. I didn't care because I knew I had a goal I had to accomplish. And I know that's very rare for... A lot of people I knew for me, I had to, because especially the the way I got on the team, I feel like I owed a lot of people some stuff. I owed coach that, hey, you did not go out and win for me for no reason. I'm going to show you why I'm meant to be here. Yeah. So all those things were playing on my head consistently, going in the with the walk-on number, not even having a jersey, not having my locker be 107 and not a real number. I said, no, I'm going to have a real locker number and a real jersey. Number. I'm not going to be all right. You get 22. You get this number. Nope. I'm going to be a part of the team. Mind you, at UCF, the players, 
they were real cool. We all felt like part of the team. But the coaches, they separated us. So I made sure I was going to be on the good side, not the bad side. So I did yeah. everything I could because I, I refused to be a loser in that in that realm. I refused to be. Yeah. So that's how I my mental toughness was at an all time high at that point. Yeah, and and there are people who they sometimes they face that, and they can crumble right? They don't have that sense of adversity tolerance. They don't have people like, you know, you know parents like your father, right? They, who, who sit there and say, if you want something like no one, no one can stop you. The only person who stands in your way is you. Um, and you make the decision what you will become, right? And in, in the man that you have to become. And obviously this goes, this is true for any athlete. Every athlete, no matter who you are, they will face that choice. Do you become obsessed about um, being great. Now this is not, you know, being the goat, right? There are some, there are very few people who are willing to walk that lonely ass path of being the greatest of all time. Um, and for some people they're like, I will walk this and it is going to be the worst experience ever. But I, and at the end of it, I don't even like, I'll get all these accolades and all this other stuff. I'm not here for that. I'm here for the obsession of knowing that I'm alone on top. Right. You look at um, people like Tom Brady, you look at people like Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or uh, these athletes who they are they're they're legends, legends of the game. Doesn't matter who you, the the Venus and Serena Williams. Right. Like uh, it, Tiger Woods. I mean, you could name any legendary athlete. And at some point they had to have that decision that talk with themselves. What do I choose to do? Do I choose to take 100 percent ownership? of every single thing that I do and create a list of all the things that are, that I can do all the choices I have, get rid of everything that doesn't serve me, the parting, the social life, the, this, the, that. Um, and do I become hyper-disciplined and have a code of ethics for myself in order to be the person who I know I want to be? Every athlete faces that very few choose to actually go down that path. But for you, you made that decision. You walked that path. And how did it turn out? It turned out I got my scholarship. Like I said, it turned out great. And the downside of that, it got to a point where I think the whole team felt this is when I got my scholarship, I got comfortable. And when I got comfortable, I lost my edge a little bit. I was always a hard worker that would do more, but I didn't do what I used to really because I'm like, all right, I can step off the gas a little bit. I got the scholarship. And the year I stepped off the gas in the year, of course, went 0-12 and, and lost every single game, which isn't the best time to step off gas and also lose every single game. That does not go hand in hand at all. And even on that, I think I let off the gas. Actually, I know exactly when I let off the gas. It was our second game of the season. I worked my way up to number one at running back. So I was on the flight. We were going to play Stanford that game. Primetime Stanford. Christian McCaffrey was playing, going to Stanford, big game, all that stuff. I worked my way up to the one running back, and on the way there, I sat next to the offensive coordinator. So any football player knows when you're in the flight and you sit next to the OC, you're bound to play. That's big time. So the OC told me, hey, I hope your parents are watching. I hope your family's this is going to be your time to make a name for yourself. It's going to be a big time, all this stuff. So I'm super hyped. I'm so excited. Great. Warm-ups, still run at the ones, everything happens. The game starts, I don't step a foot on the field. I don't run the ball once, I don't touch the ball once. Something happened, I don't know what, I probably still don't even want to know what happened, but at that point in time is where I shut off. Mm -hmm. I did all this work for what? I was running once in practice, I worked hard, I earned my spot here. I, you told me all these things, then all of a sudden, nothing? And on the flight back, he didn't speak to me once, no explanation, no anything. So I'm on the flight from California back to Florida, fuming. I've never been so angry. I said, all right, it's just me on an airplane with him. No one can stop me. <laughs> There's the police on this plane. I can do whatever I want. I was like, ah, no, let's be smart here. But at that point, I even, I was like, I, I hope we don't win a game this year. Because I put myself over everybody. It's like, I did all this work for this. This is the outcome I get, like a scholarship number one running back, and I get shut off like this. So at that point, I was like, all right, I can care less now. I really can went care through less all now. the stages of grieving. Right, all in one flight. I was like, you know what? I accept it. Screw it. Good luck. It's amazing how, I mean, that's a long flight first and foremost, but it's amazing how 
coming off of a, a bad loss or something disappointing or something like that. It's amazing how long those flights can get because a minute, and this is why like, um, running on the treadmill or doing a plank or watching the microwave. That's, that's why a minute is so long is because you are there with your thoughts watching like with a timer. And it's amazing how much you can talk in your own head. It's, it, it's like a million words a minute. Um, and there are a lot of minutes on a flight where it is just dead quiet and you're just pissed. Um, and it can be tough. Right. And, and I had, so I was a walk on as well. And, and during my, um, during my junior year, um, you know, talking to the coach and I, you know, I'd been doing a bunch of stuff and he, and he was just like, he was like, Hey, you know, we have a guy who's getting ready to graduate, who has the only scholarship for a long snapper. And we want to obviously pass that torch off to you. And I was like, that sounds amazing. I've been working my ass off. Um, and he, he was like, okay. So like, it, you know, once he graduates, we want to move it over to you. We had just gotten our asses kicked by USC, um, and went out for the, uh, for, for, you know, one of my teammates birthdays. And, um, there's a kid who, you know, showed up and, you know, shaking hands, all this other stuff. And he was just like, Hey, you know, I'm being recruited as, uh, as a long snapper. Um, and I was just like, man, that's awesome. Congratulations. And he was just like, He's like, I'm going to be coming here. I talked to the coach earlier today. They offered me a scholarship and I just like my heart sank straight into my asshole at that point, like below my stomach. And I called the coach that night and I was just like, what did I just hear out at a social event? And he said, come into my office, we'll talk. And he's like, we want to, uh, you know, we obviously made the decision to give a scholarship to someone who's going to be here and can utilize it longer. And I was just in the, the, the challenge there was I couldn't afford to play football anymore. Cause you can't, you can't hold a job, um, at all. And I, I, I had effectively run out of money and I had to, I talked to the coach and, and I flat out told him to his face, like he had lied to me. And I can't believe i Put, I went through all the stages of grief as well, but I did it right in front of my coach. Um, haven't talked to him since. I'm sure if I did, we'd probably be able to mend bridges, other stuff like that. Um, but like that, that was the end of the line for me because I couldn't afford to live on campus. I had to move back home, right? I had no money, nothing. Um, and, and, I, and that was how my career came to like this crazy plane crash halt. Um, because I, I put ev you feel like you put every single thing out there to work for something and something happens. Right. And, and it's just like your whole world comes collapsing as an athlete, because it's difficult when you put every ounce of your physical soul into something, and then it feels like it goes away. You, there's this, as an athlete, there's almost like this, it's worse than defeat in terms of the feeling that you get. There's this sense of like uselessness that you have, which can be just so terrible to try and face as a human being. Um, but I realized I was nowhere near the only athlete who had ever dealt with something like that. Right. And there's so many athletes who do. So you pull the, and, and all to bring it back to, you pulled the throttle off a little bit, uh, during that season and it sucked. Um, and that was tough. And, and being a part of a losing team, myself included, you know, the first few years of being in the Pac-12, it can be tough, right? Figuring out why you want to move forward, how you move forward. We're not losing. So what's another way that we can at least try to win or have enjoyment or fun or something? Because getting your ass kicked is one thing if it happens every once in a blue moon. It's totally different when it seems like it's happening all the time. So how do you mentally recover from, from pulling the throttle off and going 0 and 12? I mentally recover because we got a new head coach. <laughs> we, got, <laughs> we got a new head coach, and that energized me again to see the past going away. And there's a I can see the sun over the horizon now because it was a toxic culture that 0 and 12 years. Coaches didn't like coaches, players didn't like players, players didn't like coaches. It was just 
battles left and right. And it wasn't a good environment to be in. So everyone at that point pulled off the throttle. We all could care less. So when a new coach, Coach Frost, came in, that definitely excited me again because I was on scholarship still, knew I had a chance to get back to where I was. So I was very excited. Unfortunately, injuries keep piling up, piling up, piling up to where I never got to where I wanted to be playing wise, but that's fine. That comes with the game. But I definitely put my all into it again because I saw light once again, which is hard to see when you're so overcome with this darkness, you don't see an end anywhere. But just that little glimpse of getting a new coach that changed everything, especially for me, because I said, all right, I have a chance again. I don't have to fight against these politics. I don't have to fight against these coaches. I don't have to deal with people I really don't want to be around because I don't like any of you. So I can stop faking it and just truly be who I am. And that definitely is how I got back to who I was as a person. Yeah. Now, injury obviously happens. Now, before college, did you ever have any major injuries? Nope. I was clean as a whistle. (laughs) (laughs) And then you go into college and it seems like the moment you step on the turf, something feels your your knee suddenly starts to hurt a little bit, or your shoulder starts to feel a little bit. What and, and the thing is, you don't realize as an athlete. I mean, obviously, the physicality and the speed of the game, um, and and the amount of reps and all this other stuff. I mean, any sport when you go to the college level, it takes its pound of flesh, right? And and that comes for everybody at one point or another. I don't think there's an athlete who has ever come out of playing professionally or even from a collegiate perspective who doesn't have some sort of injury, whether it's minor or major, um, the, or, or if there is, there, there are, like, I, I'd have no clue who they are, right? Um, uh, may, maybe Adrian Peterson when he played in college. I don't know if he ever had an injury or Bo right. Jackson in college maybe didn't have an injury. But um, it comes for everybody, and and sometimes you're not prepped for it. Talk to me about the mental challenge of injury and what that presented to you and how you worked through it. Injury is a tough thing to deal with, especially if you've never dealt with it before. Because, of course, you get dinged and banged up here and there. That's football. But when you get to the point where it's not hurt, you're actually injured, that's when it's kind of like, oh, damn, I really got to sit out on the sideline. And especially in college, you can't make the club in the tub. So I did everything I could again. I swear I was like, well, I got to get back on the bus because I hate not being on the bus. I hate Friday morning workouts when just the scout team. Those are dreadful. Those are terrible. And I don't like doing those. I don't want to do those. So it's tough to see what you work for just at a halt. But then sometimes it helps you pick back up. All right, I got work to do again. I got to get back to even better than what I was. So there was that point. But it comes to... Where I was, I had injury after injury after injury after injuries. Like, well, damn, can I catch a break, please? I keep doing everything I'm supposed to do and I get hurt. Get close, get close, hurt. Close, close, hurt. It's like, all right, I don't know what to do anymore at this point. To, or it gets to a point where you almost lose who you are as a person because everything you were is fl- leaving you. That whole being an athlete, being on the field, being around the guys, can't do that anymore because I'm hurt. So I'm watching from the outside looking in, being in the meetings and the bus and the hotel, all that stuff, being with the guys. Can't do that yeah, because I'm hurt. So that identity I had was leaving little by little, which to my se- up to my senior year, which I had my career in, if you were, that was a wrap for me. I had a helmet to my quad, internal bleeding calcified to a whole new bone. So that ended my year short. That was the year we went undefeated, of course, beat Auburn in the Peach Bowl. So that was bittersweet, but that's that year is when I started figuring out who I was outside of being an athlete. That's when that whole, all the injuries and all that stuff, it showed its purpose and it showed its why, of why these things were happening to me, because I had a bigger purpose outside of sports. And it took me, it took a lot of long conversation with myself a lot of sitting in silence, a lot of mental breakdowns and tears to realize that I am much more than a football player. Yes, it's great and all, but who I'm meant to be is way more than an athlete. And that's that's tough. That's tough to come. I mean, to go through that in such a short period of time when you've been playing sports for at that point, what, 20 years, right? This is your, your senior season. So you're what, 22, 23 
Right. Um, and you'd been playing since you were eight and you just, it, it's devastating when it seems like you've been doing something for so long in something like six months, right? Like you have this six month time period to figure out what you're going to do next after doing something for 20 years, just about, or, or 14, 14, I don't care. Anytime over 10 years, um, it is, I mean, as an athlete, if I tell you, Hey, go do something for 10 years, I'm going to give you a week at the end of it to figure out what you want to do next. You're going to be like, I have no idea, right? Like your, your whole, there's a huge chunk of your being that is just tethered to this and on the process of untethering it and finding new purpose and, or pivoting or doing anything that's other than the game itself. I, it's nothing short of devastating for a lot of people. Um, and now obviously you help people figure that stuff out before the game is over. And I went through the exact same thing. When the game was over for me, it felt like a blink of an eye. It was like that first morning you wake up and you know, you should have been like, you know, the guys are working out um, and the game's over. Number one, you don't miss the workouts. <laughs> you don't miss waking up at 5 a.m. And, and being like going and doing your workout and um, you don't miss that. But you, you feel like there's this part of you. You're, it's almost like you've woken up and you're in like this whole, like you've been reborn again. You're like, what do I do? You're kind of like a fish out of water. You're trying to figure out how to like walk and breathe and eat and do things without somebody telling you be here at this time or else there are consequences. Right. There's this, you're, it's this weird feeling like, what was that process like for you and how'd you get through it? That was a process to say the least. I remember the first day I woke up and the sun was out. I had a panic attack. I was like, meetings, coach. Oh God, where's my phone? Check it. I was like, wait, there's no messages. Wait. I'm not playing. Oh, and the first day I was like, oh, great. I get to go back to sleep. The second day, same thing happened. Like, you know what? This kind of sucks. Now yeah. I'm just sitting here because my day from 5 a.m. to 12 to 1 p.m. was scheduled out. So now I'm waking up 8, 9. Nothing to do. I can do whatever I want at this time. To, for the whole day, I can do whatever I want. This is weird. What do I do now? Because someone's been telling me, what to do my whole life, where to be my whole life. And now I have to figure it out for myself. And I really wasn't prepared for this because no one really prepared me for this. So it's like, good luck, figure it out. Luckily, during that time, Coach Frost is gracious enough to let me always be in back with the guys. I was almost like a secondary coach for the running backs. So I'd come out and help all that stuff. But also during that time, UCF has a student athlete welfare and development office where they do everything from life skills, resume building, networking. So I went in there, I was like, all right, I'm going to need a job eventually. So I got to kind of figure this stuff out. I haven't written a resume since high school, and that resume was junk <laughs> compared to <laughs> what, I, what I've done now. So I really need to. You're like, worked at the YMCA for four months, uh, good people skills, <laughs> right? You're, you're yeah, like, this it. is, there is, there's maybe a Dairy Queen down the street who that could look at this and be like, oh, yeah, we'll take you. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's. <laughs> Dealing with that whole process, like I gotta, I gotta figure it out. So I basically lived that off. So I went from practice to interning in an office to where I soaked up everything I could. And there is kind of where I found who I was again as a person. Because we had a program where they asked a leadership program where they asked the athletes, "What do you want to do when this is over?" For the first time in my life, I didn't have an answer. And I'm the guy that has an answer for everything. Like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'll be a lawyer. I'll do this. I'll do that. Even if I don't mean it, I'll have an answer. It's the first time I'm like, oh, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore because I went, my major was law. It's like, I don't want to do that. So what do I do now? Then it's after a while, just soaking on that question, just thinking about it, milling over. It's like being in this office is where I feel comfortable again. I feel like home. I feel myself. Outside of the athlete, I feel like I have a purpose. So I went to student athlete welfare and development. I went in that route. But also during that time, I noticed a lot of the programs we would put on, most athletes didn't show up because 
nobody tells us about it or if they do we're not going because we got stuff to do whether that's sleep play video games eat schoolwork i'm not doing all that so i figured out i asked myself one why is this happening two how can i make this change so i thought to myself well i've been through ups downs ups downs and some more ups and downs why don't i take what i've done with my experience in my life do what i've learned here mesh it into one build my own curriculum and go speak to student athletes myself because you and i both know we've all had guest speakers come into all the meetings during camp all that stuff a lot of times they're like, oh it's another one for requirement i guess we all listen to this guy yeah. and I feel like dealing with that i said well i've actually played so the whole connection piece i already have because i've done that i've been where you've been all athletes have that same feeling you know when, when you're around an athlete it's like i got that point so i can do this to where i can change some lives it only takes one life that i change to show them that they're more than an athlete and realize that the sport enhances them not defines them i've done my job because the people nothing against the people at the welfare development office a lot of them didn't play sports like that and you're telling me about athletic identity all this stuff when you didn't live the life i lived i mean what you're saying is great and all but i'm not listening because it can't connect with me yeah. until you've been in the trenches and felt what an athlete's life feels like to feel what it's like to go in a classroom with gear on and be pointed out right away to feel what it's like to have all these people come around just as, oh, you're the football player, you're the athlete, you're this. To feel what it's like to go to a bar and just walk in free because everyone knows, oh, they're on the team, they got it. And then you you're 0-12 and, and everybody knows and you get and recognized no and everybody's like, so what's the problem? And you're just like, I don't know. Like, I, <laughs> right. I, you think I, I sit there and I'm like, I've got it figured out. Like you've got a board with all these mathematical equations. Like I figured it out why, why we're not winning. Because the answer is mental. Because everybody physically, like, has the ability to run, jump. They're strong. They're they're this. They're that. Um, yeah. Sometimes injuries play into that, right? If a team is absolutely demolished by injuries, then yes, you're not having you know a predictable amount of talent on a weekly basis. Um, so that is an X factor. But every team deals with that at one point or another. It all comes down to the mental stuff. Um, for a lot of people, but it, it's, it's, it's crazy how you go around. Uh, I mean, that campus experience as a whole, that's a whole nother <laughs> conversation that, that, uh, you know, I'm sure every athlete could sit there and, and be able to listen to and be able to say, man, the, like this is, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a trip when you feel like a little bit of a celebrity. Um, but then you start having like, that's a plus you feel a little bit like a celebrity, but it comes with all the negative stuff that comes with it. You lose a game, you do something, you do this, whether it's in, this is where being on special teams, being a long snapper was great because no one knew who I was. I could walk up to something and they'd be like, are you, are you in the football team? I'm like, nah, I'm a golf player. Uh, and they'd be like, <laughs> all right, come in. And, and I could, I could slip by with something like that. They're like, you're a huge golfer. And I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah, no, we, we, I, you know, I got to bring some size to the table for the team, stuff like that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it, it, just cause I didn't have the level of recognition that some other people, uh, obviously did. So, but I got to see a lot of it, right. You'd be out and you'd be with your teammates and people would say stuff and you're just like, you all of a sudden it's, it, there's like you versus the rest of your, you, like the rest of the student body in some way, shape or form. Um, Cause they can't relate to you in some ways you can't relate to them. Um, like that whole dynamic can be really, really tough. And you, and I think you made an incredible point and I've heard it also from some professional guys when they have like speakers and other stuff come in and, and, and I ask like, you know, why don't you follow up on certain services or other stuff like that? And they say, because it's with the team. My coach knows that I'm going and using the sports psychologist or using this and it's in-house. Like my coaches can see that. And then, because the last thing you want to do is be a head case. Mm -hmm. um, or the last thing you, right? Like if a coach sees you in the cold tub, it better be for like, oh yeah, no, po post-workout recovery. Like you better yeah. not be seen doing certain things because optics matter right. as an athlete. Like you said, Number one, I in the sky doesn't lie. You want to have all you, the thing you care about more than like actually playing really well out of practice is not having bad film that's going to get reviewed during, during film sessions. Like 
it's almost like you care more about having a good film session than you do being amazing out on the field sometimes when you've had a few bad film sessions. Right. Um, so it, it, there's all these different distractions that can start popping up for athletes. Um, and obviously one of them is, you know, there's resources available, but sometimes people don't use them or they're not, they're not relatable or, you know, athletes could care that on the totem pole of things they care about is much lower than some of the other stuff that um, they would rather be doing. Um, because as a college athlete, you're working 60, 70 hours a week. And all you want to do is sometimes just take a nap and not go to a meeting. Um, but the work you do obviously is with athletes who are still playing in order to help them develop as individuals and understand that the game is meant to enhance who you are. It's not supposed to define who you are. And you could be an amazing individual and just so happen to be a badass in one sport, or you could just so happen to go and do business, or you could just so happen to go and do other stuff, right? So I'd love to know more about, obviously you went and you went to these career development services and all this other stuff and you you had this idea pop up. What was that idea for Walk On Nation and what did you turn it into from idea to where it's at now? The idea definitely shaped and formed over time as most things do, but Walk On Nation has always been the same core nucleus, which is athletic identity redefined. We want to redefine what athletic identity means. Everyone stays up, if you're an athlete, that's it. What Walk On Nation focuses on is you as a person, who you are as a person, who to run, surround yourself with, and how to brand yourself. When we talk about brand, it's not so much social media, the what to do, how the algorithms, all that. Eh, I don't got time for that right now. We're talking about what legacy you want to leave behind, the internal piece. So everything we do is all internal. So if you go back to the point of how being a little celebrity on campus, the negative side, but there is a big plus side that most of us miss because we forget that there's another side to us. That's the enhanced part. Everyone wants to talk to us. Everyone wants to know us, whether that's students, teachers, people that work around the community, everybody wants to know us. So now we use that to our advantage. That's what I learned firsthand because when I was hurt, I was like, oh, I don't really tell people I'm hurt. I'm going to just tell them I played football and see what I can get from that. So I tell them that and tell them what I want to do with the Walk Nation, all these things. So I networked a lot to where it got to the point where they said, well, when you're done, let us know. We'll bring you out and do all these things. Because athletes don't realize no one cares about a has-been. Once you're out the game, no one cares about you. No, everyone cares less. Because we're in a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately business. If you're not playing or on the field right now, I can care less. Unless I built those connections prior to me leaving, it's hard for me to leave and try to build those connections back when there's someone else in my old spot. Yeah, They're always looking for the next big thing. So a walk on nation is about is when you're there, let's use it. Let's figure it out. So by the time you leave, you're not lost. Let's figure out who you are now while you're playing. There's going to be times when the sport is over. You got to hang up the jersey. You're going to get hurt sometimes. You're going to deal with a lot of things. Life is tough. I'm not here to sugarcoat you, give you a positive message like, oh, life's going to be great. Happy go lucky when you find out who you are. No. Because that's unrealistic too. But what life gets a little better when you realize that you are so much more than your sport. Athletics only is, is what you do. It's not who you are. And it's hard to understand that and, and feel that when you've been in it so much and no one tells you otherwise. It's hard to, even when you know you're going through all these things, to give you a little clam here and there. So like, for example, you go in the hotel, you get the great meal, the hotel bed, all this stuff, the lights, the cameras, all that stuff. Everyone sees that. And that's what I think athletics is. And the culture is like, oh, you guys got everything. You should be fine. You can push through all that. Little do they know we go through more than almost anybody. Yeah. From mental to physical, all these things. So knowing that Walker Nation, one, understands what the culture is. So we're not naive to what is told to us, what is taught, all that thing. But knowing that on the other side is how can we use that to our advantage? The culture treats us this way, has eyes on us. Great. Let me figure out who I am. So when the culture comes at me, I tell the culture who I am, not vice versa. Because the culture dictates how we feel. If we have a bad game, Instagram will make fun of it, highlight and bad highlight, this, that, and the third. So we feel like we're that highlight, we're that play. When when the jersey comes off or next week, they're going to forget about it. Because the next thing happened. So we're worried about something else that happened a week ago when they're already worried about the next guy. It's 
we take things to heart so much because we don't realize there's so much more to life. We think, like you said, we're so worried about the optics at all times that we're forgetting the inside. We're worried about the external, but the internal is what keeps us pushing. Without the internal, we're nothing. So even as you know, people can talk about resume building, network, and all that stuff, that's great and that's needed, but it's useless if I have no idea who I am. So I'm just trying to sell somebody a false me. And if I'm trying to hire you, I don't want a false person. I want all of you, I want an authentic you. And Walk On Nation helps you figure out you're an authentic you. We do that through workshops to where everything's interactive. I hate PowerPoints. I really hate PowerPoints, especially for athletes. You put on a PowerPoint up, we zone out. This Walk On Nation is about actually having a conversation. Where I'm not coming to be a teacher, we're just coming to have the conversation and learn from each other. Yeah. I'm taking my experience and what I've learned, and you may have a different experience from me. I'm not telling you my way is the right way because that's completely wrong too. Everyone's life is different. The main thing I'm trying to show these athletes is it is your life to live, not anyone else's. So no matter what your parents, coaches, media, anything says, they can't live your life and you cannot live theirs. And you have to realize that because once you realize that it's your life to live and only yours only, then we can start making progress. Then we can start figuring out who we are, who to surround ourselves with, how do we brand ourselves. But it all starts with realizing you got to focus on you first. Yeah. Everything else goes outside of it. Everyone goes focusing on other people than internal, which is so backwards. Focus on yourself, then everything else will follow. So that's, in a long way answer, that's what Walk on Nation covers. Which is awesome. I mean, there's so many things in there, especially as a current athlete, that's so beneficial. I mean, not only defining your own brand, right? Who you are, the code of ethics you stand by, so that when the culture and all these other things are happening around you, you can solidify your position in it and be able to allow people to see you the way that you are trying to dictate yourself as, right? And, and that doesn't have to do with social media. That can just do with your character in a lot of different ways because there are some people who don't take control of that or have ownership of those things. And it can be tough for them to really put themselves in a position where they can start taking control of that again because what people see on Sports Center or highlights or this or that, what they post – is what they normally get an idea about because that's what they're getting exposed to. Um, I want to kind of end this with when it comes to people's character, their brand, their, their, you know, these, these foundational things, what's one thing that they could focus on or do that would, that you believe makes a big difference as they're playing, as they are still playing the game that they should be starting to work on if, even if they never talk to you or see anything else ever again, like what do you think is one of the most foundational things that they can work on and do that makes a difference? I would ask three questions. Who are you? What do you want to be? What is your purpose? The three things with those questions all center around you. So until you figure out what you want, what you want to be, and what is your purpose, there's, we have nothing to talk about in that sense. Not what your parents want, all these other things. Your purpose is not your sport. And who are you? Once we figure out those three questions, that's when we can start making progress. Because then once I figure out who I am, then I can figure out what my values are. Not what the team values are. Not what my parents want my values to be, what my values are. Then I can start figuring out, all right, these are my values. What do I want to live by? What is my purpose? What wakes me up every day outside of athletics? So when this is done and I ask you those questions, it should be, all right, this is who I am. This is what I do. You got to be able to tell your, the next person, this is who I am and live with it. If they don't like it, who cares? Yep. They're not meant to like it. They can't live your life. You can't have everyone's appraise. Everyone can, won't love you. That's, a, that's human nature. We want everyone to love us, everyone to praise us. That's impossible. You have to be comfortable in your own skin to where if someone doesn't like it, who cares? It's not their life to live. Yeah. If they don't want what you want, who cares? I don't care. This is what I want. They don't like your purpose. Who cares? This is my purpose. When you can live like that and be aligned with truly who you are, then we can make progress. Then we can go out into the world and really figure out how to be successful in that nature. Yeah. And it really is, it's one of those things where athletes deal with it in, in the opposite way. Someone tells you, well, I really want to do this. and I really want to do that. You're either going to like it and be like, that's amazing, man. I, I love that. I love this. I love that. Or it's not your cup of tea. And the thing is, you're just doing the same thing for yourself, but you think you have to have people's praise because there's a little bit more media attention or people attention on you. And so you want to try and conform to have the most amount of people like you. 
No, the people who do the greatest things are the people who are have conviction in what they say and, and they don't care what other people think. And if you have five amazing raving fans, that's better than a thousand wayward people um, who could either, you know, go with or without you. If, if you play really well, do something amazing, they're with you when, you know, you have a bad week or something, you know, they couldn't speak worse about you. Like you, you'd rather people who are just, who would essentially kind of ride or die with you. And the value is a thousand times fold um, from someone who is that kind of ride or die person, which your parents will always be. Um, and there will be people who come into your life who will also be like that. Um, and the more that you have conviction about who you are and your purpose and what you want to do and all this other stuff, the, the more conviction you have behind it, the easier it will be to find those people because they will start to reveal themselves more and more frequently as you say these things. And there will be people who want nothing to do with you and they just drop off. Great. It makes it easier to find these people that really come together and almost kind of form a tribe with you. Um, and there's power behind that. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that's an amazing thing for athletes to start thinking about if they're still playing. Um, Michael, how can people either follow you, your story, find out more about you, walk on nation, other stuff like that? Yeah, so on Instagram and Twitter, walk on underscore nations where you find all the walk on nation stuff. Our website, walkonnation.org, there's a contact page. You can get a hold of me there. If you have any questions with anything, I'll be there. LinkedIn, you can find me, Michael Wood, all that stuff. So I'm pretty much open book. I pride myself. If you ask me a question, I'll answer it within 48 hours. I'm big on serving people. So if you have a question, the listeners have a question, please reach out. Do not withhold your question because you might regret it by not asking it. Absolutely. And especially as an athlete, you have to understand you don't have all the answers. And it's why college athletes have coaches. It's why um, professional athletes have coaches because you don't have all the answers. You can't see everything all at once. That's why you need to have people around you who can see the things that you can't. Um, and Michael is one of those resources who can sit there and can talk to you and be able to offer wisdom, advice, um, tips, tools, strategies, all these different things that can help you in different areas of your life, or at least give you a leg up and move you chapters ahead in that book of life that you're trying to read um, in certain areas. So take advantage of that resource, reach out to them. Um, but Michael, this has been an awesome conversation. I could sit here and I could talk to you all day and we could swap stories and laugh our ass off. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll save some of that for, for the next time that we have you on, but man, I appreciate you. Um, and uh, I mean, from, you know, one college football player who donned the black and gold to another, um, I appreciate you, man, the work that you put in the road that you've walked. Um, it's, it's one that very few people are able to walk. And so, um, just the, the legacy that you're choosing to leave for yourself with walk on nation is amazing. And, um, I, I absolutely want nothing but the best for, for you and the work that you do. And I cannot wait to see all the success that you and your business is going to have. Thank you, Keegan. I, I appreciate this so much for having me on. I say we can talk for days and days and days about this stuff. I definitely appreciate you. Appreciate this platform. All the things you're doing as well as big time. I'm glad we can come together as two minds that are on the same goal and just want to see success for athletes and people going through this stuff. So I definitely appreciate you for this. 100%. Now, anybody who's listening to this and you really enjoy Michael Willett um, and what he has to share, we are, and I say we, I mean, myself, um, Bill Dean, Morgan Koth, and Kim Brady are planning on having Michael on live with us uh, this next Tuesday. Um, I'm going to be trying to get this episode out hopefully by the end of the week. So that's, so if you're listening to this, you're probably listening to it on June 3rd. Um, and so this next Tuesday, which is going to be um, the 7th at, oh my gosh, I have to do more math. Um, 9 p.m. Eastern, which is 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, 7 p.m. my time here in the mountains. Um, you can, I whether it's, going to YouTube and go to Lamar coaching or on uh, LinkedIn, we will be live and it'll be streaming to my platform, uh, Keegan Lamar. And obviously the people who are part of the show, we all share it out afterwards anyways. 
Um, and I think we also share it live to Facebook, um, which you can just go there to at Lamar coaching, uh, and be able to find him live on there this next Tuesday. And we're going to have an awesome conversation. So I cannot wait to have you on there with the, uh, with the rest of the group. I think it's going to be a ton of fun. Um, but until then, man, I appreciate it. Once again, this was an awesome conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait for next Tuesday. Look forward to it.